Following amendment, the clerk will read the amendment. Amendment by Moody. Chair recognizes Representative Moody to explain the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, I want to be very clear to the body. The language that you see in front of you as an amendment is the substantive provisions of Chairman King's House Bill 2744. The response to the Uvalde mass shooting that would raise the age to purchase most rifles from 18 to 21. This is the same bill that earlier this week was voted 8-5 by a committee in a bipartisan fashion. The bill allows people age 18 to 20 to own a 22 caliber rifle, and it allows them to possess a rifle in the presence of a lawful transfer or on private property, or while hunting, or at a range, or for shooting sport. It also doesn't apply to those working in law enforcement or the military. That is what it does. Mr. Speaker? Representative King, for what purpose? Uh, will the gentleman yield for a question? Does the gentleman yield for a question? Yes, sir. Gentleman yields. Thank you, and I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing this amendment to the bill. And um, this bill, uh, there's been some uh, allegations that it would stop an adult from buying a, uh, one of these types of weapons for his uh, child to use on their ranch or anything, but there are some exemptions in this bill. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, I think the exemptions which you worked on painstakingly to make this as narrow as possible, because we know there's litigation in this arena, and a lot of it's going to be based on the, the narrowness of, of, the, of the legislation itself. And so the exceptions include, uh, and particularly the one that you're talking about, if they're in the presence of a lawful transfer or, or on private property or while hunting or at a range or if they're shooting sport, all those activities are not gathered up in the provisions of this amendment. And so so the, there's an exemption for peace officers, correct? There's also an exemption for peace officers. And in fact, when, um, you know, when, when there were concerns raised uh, to your office about folks in the military, because you have folks in the military that are under yeah. 21. And your response was, and I think rightfully so, to exclude them out of the bill. And they're, and not, there's in the, an and they're not in this amendment either. Folks that are honorably discharged from the United States Armed Forces. It includes them as well, yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. And if you've already said this, I apologize. I, did, I couldn't tell what you were, I couldn't hear you. And then there's an exemption for the transfer of the semi automatic rifle to a person. Uh, to carry while in the presence of the transfer, or while on the property owned or leased by the transfer, or on the premises of a sports shooting range, uh, for the purpose of lawful hunting or sporting, at a lawful competition, and using the use of firearm. So that covers the uh, the um, the instance where someone wanted their 16-year-old, for example, 15-year-old, to have one of these weapons with them when they were driving around on a ranch or something like that, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. It covers all of those instances because those were the concerns that were raised and, and, and in your work, which was diligent and thorough, you addressed them by taking them out of the bill. In fact, I, I do not know of any group that came forward to you with an, uh, with an objectively reasonable scenario and a fact pattern that you didn't say, I will write that out of the bill. Yeah. So distilled down... Once you get past all those exceptions, all the bill says, I'm sorry, the amendment at this point says, is that someone between the age of 18 and 20, totally unsupervised, can't go and purchase yeah. a high-powered rifle. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, um, do you remember how old you were when you got your first rifle? I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Do you remember how old you were when you got a rifle, first time? Oh, uh, boy. Um, I remember shooting a rifle sometime in my late teens. Well, I've seen you shoot before, and it's pretty impressive, by the way. <laughs> um, well, I was, I was, older, I was uh, probably, I think I was 12 years old, 14 years old, and I got a rifle. And uh, it was a 22, single shot 22. And then later on, I got a deer rifle, which was a, uh, a Remington. Uh, and... Um, it had five shots in it, but it was a bolt-action deer rifle like all people use. Is there anything in this bill that would keep a teenager from being, a, or a, an 18-year-old, for example, from being able to buy any of those types of rifles? 
No, in fact, you specifically accepted them from the provisions of, of, that, of the bill, and that's, that's exactly what's mirrored in the amendment that's before the body. So the rifle that nearly everybody got when they were a teenager, or the first rifle they bought, is uh, not affected by this bill at all? No, not at all. Uh, I think you got a great amendment. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, will the gentleman yield? Representative Martinez Fisher, for what purpose? Gentleman yield for questions? Does the gentleman yield for questions? Yes, sir. Gentleman yields. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Chair Moody, I appreciate the amendment. I, a lot of um, emotion in, in, in what we do in every day, but with regard to this amendment, it's particularly emotional. Uh, you know, please tell us why this, in many instances, is a personal you know, decision to have this kind of discussion, because I know it affects us all. It, it does, and sadly, it's likely to impact more of us in a more profound way in the near future. But for me, after what happened in El Paso, and then being asked to travel to Uvalde, I distinctly remember a couple of the family members noting that I was from El Paso. And they said, you know nothing's gonna change. What's different? What's gonna change? And I told them that you have to have hope or you shouldn't be in this business. I promised those families, just like I promised those in El Paso, that I would fight every hour, every minute, every day that I was in this body to address safety. And I still have that hope today. And I am still fighting today because that was my promise and will remain my promise. And, and part of our job, I mean, there's so, so much is not known. Oh, people think we come here, we push a button, we propose legislation, but every single day we're trying to figure out ways to advocate for our constituents and people that we love and, and those that live in this great state. And that's all you're doing with this amendment is, is, is finding opportunities so that we can be heard and have a chance to, to have this discussion and have this vote and make a policy choice. That's what this is about, right? This is a policy discussion that deserves to be had. And there are many ways to get there. One of the ways is to bring an amendment to the floor and that's what we did today. And I tell you, it seems like a lifetime ago already, but just earlier this week, uh, when the substance of this amendment was voted out as a bill, um, I took note of something. I've been around the families from Uvalde for near on a year now. Not once before that day had I ever seen any one of them smile. Not one of them had I seen shed a tear out of anything but sadness. Not once had I hugged them and felt that there was some hope and warmth until that vote. Those folks deserve this conversation and they deserve to have that hope going forward. And there's, and you know, with regard to this amendment and what you're seeking to accomplish, what, what concerns me as a body is we try to narrowly focus on this issue of being, you know, a right to bear arms and what we are talking about is responsible limitations that because of your advocacy and many others and because families have not given up and have transformed their mission to say we're not going to let this tragedy define us, we're going to continue to, to make change, uh, this is really just a sensible solution to prevent future acts of mass violence, don't you agree? Absolutely. And, and Mr. Martinez Fisher, the point you raise is exactly what I've been trying to talk to folks about for a long time. We talk all about rights, but never about responsibility. That's what this amendment is about, being responsible. And let me be clear, had this been law last year at this time, those teachers, those kids would be alive today, full stop. 
And so it's, I mean, it's, it's listening to you say that, I can't even see you. I just have a vision and an image in front of me in my mind, in my heart, about a very sad day that we will never forget. You don't even have to live in Uvalde. You don't even have to live in Texas. Uh, if, you have a, if you have an internet signal, you know, I was looking at some coverage about mass violence and semi-automatic weapons. I mean, it's, it's coming up in foreign languages about things happening in this state, and, and it is about responsibility. And I think that, that that mindset hopefully is changing. I hope that today on this vote, we're not voting on whether we have arms, we're voting on whether we want responsible ownership, which I think is what your amendment does. This is a very narrowly drafted change in the law that Mr. King has worked on for months, understanding the litigation that's pending, understanding how you have to be nuanced when you, when you regulate in this, in this space. It is as narrow as it possibly could be drawn. It takes into account every exception, every concern that was brought to his office. And so why can't we have this discussion about responsible gun ownership? The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Speaker, move to extend. Representative Martinez Fisher, for what purpose? Move to extend. Members, you heard the motion. Is there objection? The chair hears none. Motion to extend is granted. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, chair Moody, just picking up on the conversation, uh, what, I, what I also fear for, what I'm fearful of is just sort of the continuity and the repetition of weapons like these being involved in mass violence. And, and, and I want your opinion, but in my, my assessment is that you read an article about uh, a mass violence and it's very quick to point out uh, who was the shooter, who were the... victims, and then right next to that is what kind of weapon was used, and I, I worry about that as a trend, that now it almost seems like it's part of the story, that those three items are always in the top paragraph, the names may be different, location may be different, maybe a different city, but the one thing that's always consistent that there was a semi-automatic rifle involved in these mass violence events is, do you see it that way? Yeah, I mean, that, that's certainly been the trend in the recent past. And these are, um, these are weapons that can do an extreme amount of damage in a very short period of time. And when you marry that with youthful folks that have no supervision, like the attacker in Uvalde, who, by the way, made attempts to purchase before he turned 18 and was thwarted every turn, every turn, he was thwarted. So our law worked. For those people that say, Laws, you know, only the good people follow the laws. That, that's, that's presuming that there's, there's this bizarre world that bad guys operate in that we don't operate in. If there's impediments in the world, they exist for all of us, not just some of us. And this is the concrete example of how our laws do work to thwart bad actors. In this case, once the impediment was removed, a massacre occurred. And, and help me, because I know, I guess part of the counter argument will be, well, if you, you don't have to be 21 to serve in the military and hold one of these rifles and use one of these rifles, and, but you have to be 21 to buy beer. And, and, and so, you know, help the body understand the rationale that we have such a high bar for the purchase and consumption of alcohol, but we have such a low bar for a semi-automatic, an automatic weapon. You know, I've, I've heard some of the discussion around that. Uh, I certainly think that um, you know, we have an obligation to be as responsible as we can be. And we have, part of the reason why you have limitations on, on alcohol and things alike is the effect that it has on that individual is, is young, when they're still developing, their brain's still developing, the body's still developing. The, the, and you've seen this in other conversations about other substances as well. More profound impacts, and so you want to expand that out to a higher age. 
um, we know the brain science here too and, and, the, and the behavior of people that are of this age group. And so when we're talking about a lethal weapon and one that can create very significant damage very quickly, uh, I think the treatment should be uh, at least similar. Now you did raise the issue of, of being in the military and I think you know, Mr. King uh, was very clear that if you are in the military and that's the decision you've made, which is a brave decision to make, uh, we're, not, we're not going to impede you with this amendment. This amendment would not impact you one bit. So if you are bravely making that sacrifice and are being on the front lines, then this wouldn't apply to you. Right, and, we, and that was a conversation with Chair King. I mean, I know their members were milling around and, and you know, it's the last day to pass bills, so everybody's busy. But that, that, was the, that was the essence of the discussion that we're not, this amendment is not an attempt on somebody's hunting rifle or, or to, to put some across the board age limit. Uh, you know, please tell the body one more time. I mean, what, what is this amendment and in the, in the narrow limitation here? No, I mean, when you distill it down with all the exceptions that we've discussed, what the core of the amendment does is says someone between the ages of 18 and 20 when totally unsupervised can't go and purchase a high-powered rifle by themselves that's it mr speaker mr speaker representative wally for what purpose the gentleman yield just for this gentleman yield for questions yes gentleman yields chairman moody you you spent time in in uvalde is that correct yes sir uh, how many you and chairman burroughs together along with staff uh, spent significant amount of time working on a investigation and a report is that correct yes sir okay um, you were privy to a lot of documents photos and um, interactions uh, and sitting down with family members is that my understanding we were given the entire investigative file from the uh, that came by the Department of Public Safety. We, in, as a committee, interviewed a number of witnesses. We personally went to the school, into the hallway. We met with family members. We met with the teachers that were there. Uh, met with law enforcement that had first responded. Uh, I think it was... In, probably the most thorough investigation of its type. You, one of the number one recommendations, uh, I, I don't want to say recommendations, but understandings of, of that work was this amendment. Is that, and and that's, this is what the families want. Is that? I, the, the, the purpose of the investigation, I want to, I want to be clear, the investigation the, the investigative committee was not asked to provide legislative recommendations. What we were asked to do were set level the facts. What happened? What happened? Because the, in, in, the, in the aftermath of this tragedy, there was confusion about basic facts. And, and there was no trust in the government actors that were providing the facts and the information. And so our task, which I believe was probably an incredibly tall task, was to set level and create trust in the information being provided. And so what we did was provide that information. And as an extension of that, I believe when you set level the facts, people like you and I, policymakers, can then go look and they go, what can we do here? And there were four significant sections of that report. One of them dealt with the attacker. I believe that's the, the chapter is titled that. That is the chapter that talks about his attempts to purchase a weapon and talks about them being thwarted, talks about him trying to attempt straw purchases. So those were the facts of that case, of that instance, and the, and the policy proposal that is drawn from when those very accurate facts is this amendment would have precluded that tragedy from happening. And, 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 and I, uh, thank you for that clarification the, the the committee the report didn't issue recommendations but findings of fact correct and those are undisputed look i we i will stand behind that report uh at any time and the and the uh the facts are that he days after turning 18 he sought and was successful 
in purchasing these high capacity weapons of war. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, in your deliberations, these, uh, again, these family members have, and, and we as policymakers are now here to uh, set the policy tone in, in how we respond to this situation. And this is the way we know how to do it. Is that fair to say? This is our job. I think, and, it, was, I think it was extremely important to lay the facts bare, as ugly as they were, as difficult as they were. And it wasn't just, it wasn't just access to the firearm that was in the facts that bore out in that report. This body has deliberated school safety and school hardening and school security. This body has, has discussed uh, police accountability and reform. This body has discussed the flow of public information. They've all come to this House floor. The only thing that has not been brought to this House floor until right now via this amendment is the access to firearms. If we're going to talk about the problems of mass violence, we have to talk about every single one of them. I have supported school security. I have supported police accountability. I have supported getting public information done the right way. But I also support common sense safety reforms like this. If we're not willing to have the entire discussion, then we're doing a great disservice, not just to the families that deserve it in Uvalde, but to the entire state of Texas. Let, and, and you, you uh, the families of Uvalde, the children, McKenna Lee Elrod, 10. Layla Salazar, 11. Miranda Mathis, 11. Nevea Bravo, 10. Jose Manuel Flores, Jr., 10. Xavier Lopez, 10. Tess Marie Mata, 10. Rogelio Torres, 10. Ellie Amaya Garcia, nine. Eliana Torres, 10. Anabel Guadalupe Rodriguez, 10. Jackie Casares, nine. Uzea Garcia. Jace Carmelo Luevanos, 10. Maite Rodriguez, 10. Jayla Nicole Silguero, 10. Irma Garcia, 48. Eva Mireles, 44. Emery Joe Garza, 10. Lexi Rubio, 10. Alicia Ramirez, 10. Those are the names of the children and the, the children and the two teachers. Yes, They've sir. come weekly, is that correct, to this okay. body. Chairman's time has expired. Move adoptions. Representative Wally, for what purpose? Uh, extension of time, briefly. It requires unanimous consent. Is there objection? The chair hears objection. Representative Cain, for what purpose? Mr. Speaker, I raise the point of order against further consideration of this amendment under Rule 11, Section 2, on the grounds that the amendment is on a subject different from the subject under consideration. Bring your point of order down front, Mr. Cain.